Hey, this is Glover Teixeira, UFC Light Heavyweight Champion. Hi, I'm Robbie Lawler. What's up, Fight Family? This is your favorite MMA coach, Thiago Alves, the Pitbull. Hey, what's up, guys? I'm Pedro Moyes. Mike Brown. Hey, I'm Alex Alenik. And welcome. And welcome. And welcome. And welcome. And this is We Want One Picks. And you're watching We Want Picks. To We Want Picks. To We Want Picks. To We Want Picks. To We Want Picks. Hi, everybody from America. My name's Angelo, and welcome to We Want Picks. I'm gonna break down the entire UFC Vegas 56 fight card. I'm gonna give you my predictions, my picks, and my bets. And if you want 50 free dollars, go to wewantpicks.com slash bets, sign up with any one of our five betting partners, make a deposit, and we send you $50 as a thank you. Cash app, PayPal, Venmo, literally however you want your money, 50 bucks for free, wewantpicks.com slash bets. Just sign up and make a deposit. And this breakdown is brought to you by Earn You. Earn You is the world's first sports and esports prediction game, allowing you to earn crypto risk free. Check them out now at earnyou.io. We're coming back after a week off. I've actually enjoyed this week off. I needed it. Not pick wise, picks have been going pretty well, but I just needed the break from all of this. And now I'm excited to jump back into it. It's not the greatest card in the world, but we have four. Teen fights with some pretty solid matchups. And opening up the card, we have Aaron Blanchfield taking on JJ Aldritz. And Aaron Blanchfield is a nasty grappler, and she showed people in her last fight just how dominant her wrestling can be as well. She also has solid striking, but that's not her path to victory. Using her wrestling to get on top and work her grappling from there is always her path. Aaron is still young, still cleaning things up, but she's improving quickly and can absolutely be a contender this time next year. JJ Aldrich is a decision machine. She's a decent striker with good takedowns and great top pressure if she gets there. She fights well within her skill set and she doesn't really take any risk, which is why she has so many decision wins. She's primarily a striker, but she does have a negative striking differential and she relies on volume to squeak out wins. So she does get hit pretty often, but she pumps it out there. She puts out that high volume and that's how she squeaks out some of those decisions. And the most interesting thing about this fight or what I found interesting when breaking this down is JJ Aldrich has had 14 fights, 15 fights, and I feel like she had 30. In my mind, she's like this grizzled vet that's been here forever, and she really hasn't. She's only got 15 total fights, and I thought, wow, JJ Aldrich, big step up for Aaron, lots of experience difference, and then I'm, you know, and then I'm doing what I do to do these breakdowns, and I was surprised. And I don't know why I was surprised, but I was just surprised like, oh wow, yeah, she really hasn't been here that long, but you know, she definitely has more fights than Aaron does, especially at the UFC level, but I don't think the experience gap is going to be wide enough to make much of a difference here. I was thoroughly impressed with Aaron Blanchfield in her last fight, the composure, her ability to stick to a game plan, and she looked really good in that win. I think it's more of the same from Aaron here. I think she dominates in a heavy grappling win, and betting-wise, I may throw a money line bet on Aaron. I'm going to see what that line does over the next few days. Then we have Andreas Mikolaitis, and he's taking on Renat Fakhretdinov. Listen, you guys said you were going to go to our free Discord and write out the pronunciations of some of these names. I'm going to need some help here with Renat, 17 consonants, two vowels, Anov. But Andre Mikolaitis, he's a decent striker. He likes to come forward and grind. He'll work his way inside with big looping overhand strikes, and then he'll try to drag you down to the mat. Everything he throws has lots of power, but they do come from really far away, which leaves openings that can be exploited. He's coming off that loss to Alex Pajeda, where he was able to get Pajeda down, but he just couldn't hold him down. Renat Fakhnerdinov is making his UFC debut after an impressive performance on Dana White's Looking for a Fight. He's a wrestler with heavy hands and a willingness to strike. He's constantly pressuring forward, throwing big one-twos, and then just bending over and grabbing legs to work a takedown. His takedowns are interesting because he doesn't take full shots, meaning he doesn't lower his level and then work into the hips from there. He literally bends over, which technique-wise is terrible technique, 
but he's really successful at doing it and doing it that way, just bending over and letting your back and arms do all the work. Again, technique wise, it's poor technique, but in a fight, doing that prevents him from getting stuck underneath somebody. You, you, you go to your knees, you get stuck underneath somebody. Now you're in a weird scramble you don't want to be in. So it's, it's not in a straight up wrestling match. Your coach will be screaming at you. In fights, it works really, really well for him specifically. And then when he gets on top, he pounds away. He's looking for a TKO more than a submission. And Renat's got 20 wins with 15 stoppages. But if you look a little closer, you'll see that 14 of them are against guys with losing records or have fewer than five fights. With that being said, though... He is coming off a win over a UFC vet. His last three fights were appropriate level competition, meaning they had you know a good amount of wins and they had solid records. And this is the second fight in a row that Michaelitis, the UFC seems to be using him to showcase the talent of a hyped prospect. And unfortunately, I do think it's going to work again. I see Andreas coming forward with those big shots, potentially a takedown attempt, but Renat has the better wrestling. I think they have equal power. And he should be able to get Andreas down and pound away. So Renat to win this fight, you know, I think he's going to win. He's my pick. But 3-1 to one odds does worry me a bit here because at the end of the day, Michaelitis is an actual UFC vet. He's got some solid wins. He's, he's a, a pretty well-rounded guy. And Renat making an official UFC debut. We'll see how that goes. But I do think he'll be able to pull it off. Then we have the pretty exciting Jeff Molina taking on Zalgas Zumagulov. Jeff Molina is a good striker. He has no problem getting into a war. He uses his kicks really well for range and then to engage. He'll work his opponent's legs and bodies to slow them down. So he does a really good job wearing his opponents out and making sure they have issues later in the fight. He's got a ton of volume and he's always working forward. He has power, but it's not necessarily one punch, get slept power, but there is some power there. Zalgas Zumagulov is very tough. He has solid power himself and very good wrestling. His goal is always to throw big looping punches, get you to react, and then he'll work a takedown from there. And these stats are very deceiving because while he averages more than one takedown per fight, he only has a 20% accuracy. But I've mentioned this before. You know, when you get guys that have decent takedown averages but terrible takedown accuracy percentages, it's an indication of chain wrestling. And Zalgas is a chain wrestler. He'll take a shot, he'll miss it. He'll transition to his second shot, miss it, get the third. He's now at 33% accuracy, but it was really one entry, and then he just continued to work from there. And it's an interesting fight because I tend to lean towards wrestlers in these type of matchups, but Zalgas can be chinny, and Molina has been taken down five times in three fights. So there's a logical case to be made for both of these guys and their styles, but I'm going to lean Molina here because even in two fights, where he was taken down multiple times, he was able to keep the pressure and control the striking to win those fights. So the pick is Molina, but I definitely think he needs to relax with those kicks because Zalgas starts catching those. All of a sudden, Zalgas wins his fight by decision. So Jeff Molina is the pick, but this should be an interesting fight. And speaking of wrestlers, we got Tony Gravely taking on Johnny Munoz Jr. And Tony Gravely is a wrestler who loves to come forward with volume and power, then transition right into his wrestling so he can work some old school ground and pound. He's very strong. He uses that strength really well for his takedowns and to do damage. Tony's big issue is he gasses out. He's got questionable submission defense. He does average almost seven takedowns per fight. And think about that. Seven. That's a ridiculous number. One, of, If I dig through all the stats, this is probably one of the highest takedown averages of any fighter in the UFC. But there are no secrets to what Tony gave the game plan is. He's just going to wrestle, 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 wrestle. Johnny Munoz is a BJJ black belt. He's got decent striking and his own solid takedowns. He throws with 100% effort at all times, but like most grapplers, that's really just there to set up the takedowns and set up the grappling. He uses both front kicks and side kicks well to manage range and keep his opponents at distance, but he can be a bit slow or lazy with them, and that could definitely lead to takedowns. With that being said, his grappling is very slick, both on bottom and on top. I love Tony Gravely in this matchup. His wrestling should absolutely be able to get this to the ground and his top pressure 
can control from there and pound away from there. The problem is that five of seven t losses, Tony's losses, are by submission. And seven of Munoz's wins are by submission. And I don't normally care about those things like those, oh, well, this guy loses by submission. I don't normally connect those dots and make a big deal out of it. But Tony is a grinding wrestler who does have some cardio issues. So he can definitely get tired on top, get a little lazy on top, and then get caught. This could look exactly like Tony's last fight, though, where he blew through Simon Oliveira with an insane 11 takedowns. Or look like the fight against Brett Johns, where he was taken down six times himself and then submitted. So I am really split here. My gut is saying stick with Tony because if nothing else... I am positive he's going to wrestle. I'm positive that he'll be on top and he will get a good amount of control. He may get caught later, but he'll definitely be able to dictate at least a good portion of this fight. Johnny can be hesitant to engage and stay on the outside. So I do like Tony to win this fight. He is the pick, but I do think this is a pretty close fight. Then we have Benoit St. Denis taking on Nicholas Stolze. And Benoit's a very good wrestler with really well-timed shots and tons of pressure on top. He isn't a cage-grinding wrestler. He's actually like a lower your level and shoot a double, attack the legs type wrestler. And I just, as a wrestler myself, I just love to see that. And when he gets it to the ground, he has very good pressure and he works two submissions really well. He's got a ton of power on his feet and he brings that power to the ground as well. Nicholas Stolze is a solid striker who has almost 20 professional kickboxing matches. He uses kicks really well to set up strikes or even set up his grappling. Even though he's an experienced kickboxer, he does have solid takedowns and a very capable ground game that he has used in six of his 12 wins. He's looking for his first UFC win after being knocked out in his last fight and out grappled in the one before that. Stolze is a dangerous striker, but he has not been able to find a rhythm in the UFC. And I think this matchup is more of the same. I think Benoit works in his wrestling and grinds out Stolze the same way Ramazan Amiv did. The only thing that worries me is how incredibly hittable St. Denis because is because if he lets Stolze hit him 167 times like his last opponent did, he might be put out. So St. Denis the pick because of the grappling, but this is another really tricky fight where two guys are looking for their first UFC win and two guys have pretty clear paths to victory. Then we've got Ode Osborne taking on Zaruk Adeshev. Ode Osborne is a southpaw striker who uses range well to keep people at the end of his punches. He has a ton of power and great finishing ability, especially at his new home of 125 pounds. He was a 145 pounder. This is his third fight at 125. That's a big, a big jump. He's got three wins in the UFC with takedowns in two of them. And he may use some of that grappling in this matchup because Zaruk Adeshev is a kickboxer who made the transition to MMA but he's not had a ton of success just yet. When you watch his fights, it's very obvious he's a kickboxer because his ground game is almost non-existent. But if he can keep fights standing, he can be very dangerous because he too possesses some real power. This should be a clear win for Ode because not only does Ode have the grappling if he needs it, but he also has insane power. And we have seen Adeshev have issues with power and volume. But the reality is that Ode did not look great in his last fight. He looked slow. His punches were all looping. And a fast technical striker should be able to get inside of those looping punches and have success. I just don't think Adeshev is that guy. I think Ode is too dangerous here. And he's definitely the pick. But, you know, don't let Adeshev's miserable MMA record fool you. He is an accomplished striker. Then we've got Damon Jackson taking on short notice Daniel Argueda. Damon Jackson is a very good grappler. He's an opportunist grappler, meaning he snatches things up in scrambles instead of just plodding through techniques and positions. He's willing to slug it out at times, which is actually an asset for him depending on the matchup. because he's And he's coming off a submission wing against Kamala Kirk where his boxing was super clean and technical. He does not have much power, but he does land some really heavy shots and then immediately work for takedowns after that. Daniel Argueda is stepping up on short notice after Derek Minner dropped, but he did fight just three weeks ago. And 
he's a short, stocky grappler who many times doesn't even bother striking. He just comes across the cage, wraps up your body, and muscles you to the ground. He has very nice pressure and leaves almost no space for his opponents to work up. He's one single game plan in all of his fights, and that's get you to the ground and pound away. Damon Jackson is on his second stint in the UFC, and this time around, he has some pretty nice fights, you know, some solid wins. He's 3-1 and one with wins over Charles Rosa and Mursad Bekdik. His loss is to Ilya Teporia, and that's a, that's a very credible loss. But he does rely on his wrestling and grappling in his wins. But if you push that game plan against him, you can have some success. His takedown defense is only 35%, and I think Argueta is going to have some success exploiting that. Where Damon will entertain the striking and actually, you know, actually look good doing it, Argueta is not going to waste any time doing that. He's going to come forward, immediately start grappling. And I like Argueta in this fight because of that game plan. I think just coming forward and shooting is, is going to get Damon Jackson now worrying about defending takedowns instead of trying to get his own, which is what he normally does. The short notice turnaround, three-week turnaround, that does worry me a little bit. But betting-wise, so Daniel Argueta is the pick. Betting-wise, I might throw a money line bet on him, and I'm definitely going to throw a three-and-a-half when that's available. If you don't know what the three and a half is, basically you are buying three and a half points on the judge's scorecard. It's a perfect bet for situations like this where you have a decent sized underdog because I think he's a two to one underdog. The plus three and a half will probably get you even money, but all David Argueta will need to do is win one round. If he wins one round in real life on the judge's scorecard, I bought myself a second round and I hit my bet. Go to wewantpicks.com slash bets. We have five partners. Bet Online is the one partner that offers that bet, and I absolutely love it for fights like this. Jump into that bet. Use our link, and I'll send you $50 as a thank you. That's wewantpicks.com slash bets. Then we've got grapple heavy Joe Selecki taking on Alex Da Silva. Joe Selecki is a very good grappler who leans heavily on his wrestling and his takedowns. When I first broke down Joe about a year ago, I called him Jim Miller 2.0. And that's basically still the case because he's very slick on the ground. He really makes things happen with pressure and transitions. But he's got solid hands. His boxing is clean and crisp. And it's not just there to set up takedowns. But he will lose to more technically sound strikers like he did against Jared Gordon in his last fight. Alex Da Silva is a slick striker with a wide array of attacks. He has fantastic speed and legit power. He has a bouncing style that allows him to jump in throw and then immediately jump back out. He isn't just a striker though. He has fantastic wrestling and grappling as well. His takedowns are well-timed and he sneaks them in at the end of combinations when his opponents are looking to strike back. He throws a combination, his opponent's looking to strike and bang, he lowers, takes his shots there. And this is a really fun fight and this is a lot closer than these odds are going to have you think. Right now, the odds have Selecki as a minus 165 favorite, which means, and if you watched our betting uh, our betting breakdown video with Chris Riley, who walks through probabilities and betting odds. A minus 165 favorite, it means he has a 62% chance of winning. And I don't know if that's the case. Alex Da Silva hits hard. He has great takedowns and his own slick jujitsu. If we match them up skill for skill, I think Da Silva is the much better striker. The wrestling advantage is probably to Joe. BJJ is probably very slight to Joe as well, but the power advantage is definitely to Da Silva. And what's interesting about wrestling is it's not always the better wrestler who wins, but more often the person who takes the shot first, who's willing to use the wrestling first. And I think Alex may take those wrestling shots early because if you look at their fights, even though Alex is a talented striker, he goes to his wrestling more often than Selecki does. So this pick is really hard. And I think I'm leaning Alex here, but I might change that later in the week. I'm, I'm really, really torn here. Betting action, this is probably a plus three and a half bet for Alex. I just broke down what that was. I'm buying a round on the judge's scorecard. Or a split decision win for Joe. Something along those lines. I have not placed a bet on this yet, but I, I, I might. I might. I'm going to see what the lines do this week. But super, super close fight. I do like Alex De Silva here. But again, I'm probably going to buy a round and do the plus three and a half. Then we have a really weird fight that was put together 
short notice. This was just put together a few days ago. We got Felice Herrick coming back after a year or so layoff. Carolina Kovashevitz coming back after about a year layoff. Between these two women, they have not won a fight. Won a fight in four years. This is a really weird matchup that was put together out of absolutely nowhere. But Felice Herrig is taking on Carolina Kovashevitz. Felice Herrig's a pretty well-rounded fighter, and she's an OG in women's MMA. She's been a professional since 2009, and she's pretty much fought every decent fighter in the last 10 years. She's got solid takedowns, solid scrambles, solid kickboxing, and she was one of the first well-rounded women on the scene. She's not great anywhere, but she is decent everywhere. Karolina Kovashevitz is a very good striker who at one point was a legit contender. Before this recent skid, which is five losses in a row, she had some solid wins, including one against Rose Nama Yunus in 2016. Her last win was against Felice Herrig in 2018. She's a good kickboxer with solid technique and power for that division. And it's easy to say she's on a five-fight losing skid and she's got nothing left. What's she even doing? But if you look at those five losses, she lost to former champion Jessica Andrade, Michelle Waterson, Alexa Grasso, Jan Shannon, and Jessica Panay. The Jessica Panay loss. That's not great. But the other ones are solid losses to solid ranked opponents. And I mentioned this is a rematch. Or maybe I didn't mention it, but this is a rematch. And their first fight was very close. Carolina won a decision where neither women had any success with their takedowns. But Carolina was able to outstrike Felice 140 297. And it's just borderline impossible to say what's going to happen in this fight. Carolina is honestly the, the better fighter. But she has not looked like herself in years. And I do think she has lost that passion, that drive. I, I think she's just fighting to fight at this point. Felice is scrappy. She's well-rounded. She's also been pretty inactive. This is literally a coin flip fight. This Like, flip a coin and that's the pick. Honestly, I don't want to pick it. I don't want to bet it. There's too many variables to work on here. I, I need to make a pick because that's literally the show. But don't don't do anything with this. Don't don't place a bet. Don't care about my pick. This is there's just too much crap going on here. But if I have to do a pick, it'll be Felice. I, I know Carolina's the better fighter, but she man she just looks like a shell of herself. And I've been on the scene with Felice a little bit back in the XFC days when I was managing some of those people, and Felice was in the XFC. She gets after it. Like, she gets after it, and I, I can't imagine, even with the long layoff, I think she still cares. I think she's going to go out there and try to make it happen. So Felice is the pick, but again, do, do nothing with that. Do nothing with that. But then we have a really fun fight. We've got Alonzo Menafield taking on Askar Mazarov. Alonzo Menafield, he's got great power, great takedown defense, and he's just looking to take your head off with every single punch. Historically, the knock on him was his cardio, and we've seen him gas out in the past, but in his fight against Ed Herman and even in the loss against William Knight, he showed that he can keep a pace for 15 minutes. Alonzo has power, speed, and athleticism with an 83% takedown defense, and now you're going to give him some cardio? That makes Alonzo Menafield a pretty dangerous guy. Askar Mazharov is an athletic striker with a good amount of power. He's not the most technical striker, but he does put power behind it pretty much all of his strikes. He has okay pure grappling, but his takedown defense is purely strength-based. And when he hits the ground, he does actually work pretty well from there. It's interesting. And I'm, I'm not trying to push a narrative here. I'm not trying to, you know, whatever. But he started his career as a skinny middleweight. And now he is a very thick, light heavyweight. This is his UFC debut. And I'm very interested to see what he looks like physically in the UFC because of the testing. And there is a year layoff here. Almost like, okay, let me take a year get everything out of my system and, and go from there to get in the UFC. And I, I know nothing and I'm not trying to, I hate accusing people of anything, but you know, if you follow his career and his body transformation, it's, it's been interesting. And I almost immediately picked Askar when I saw the matchup against Menafield here because he's powerful, he'll bang, and he's very creative with his striking. I, I basically thought this would be the Alonzo Menafield william Knight fight that we thought we were going to get, not the decision that we did get. But the more I dug into it, the more I saw that, 
you know, Ascar has those first round or bust tendencies. The more I saw the dramatic size increase, and then that worried me. But, you know, Menafield being KO'd by St. Pru worries me here as well because Mrazov throws with intent. So this is a really close fight, but I think the pick's going to be Alonzo here because of the UFC experience. And there's just too many unknowns with Ascar. Betting-wise, I'm going to throw one unit that this fight does not go the distance at minus 350. Traditionally, I would think that a minus 350 bet is just way too wide. But if you, again, watch that probabilities video that I did with Chris Wiley. Wiley. He's not a coyote. Chris Riley. It was enlightening because a minus 350 basically means or translates to 77% probability. So that is saying that this fight does not go the distance 70%, 77% of the time. And I 100% agree with that. I think this fight does not go to the distance 90% of the time. So minus 350, yeah, I'll take those odds. So I placed that bet does not go the distance minus 350. Alonzo Menafield is the pick. Watch that probabilities video. You will learn a lot about what these lines actually mean, where they come from, and what to do with them. So anyway, Alonzo Menafield, fight does not go the distance, are my plays. And then we have Pollyanna Botelho taking on Karine Silva. Pollyanna Botelho is a creative striker who at times can try to be fancy, can try to be showboaty, and it ends up a little sloppy. She's definitely a solid prospect, though, and you can tell that she's still learning and she's improving every single fight. Because of her creativity, though, she does not have the greatest fight IQ that you could, you know, that, that's what happens. She gets creative with her strikes and she'll make poor decisions to be fun. Not the right decision for the moment, but the decision to throw something exciting out there instead. She likes to fight at distance, but she can work in wrestling and grappling as well. She was able to take down Luana Carolina in a very close loss and Lauren Miller twice in a win. Karina, or Karine Silva, is a powerful grappler who's constantly working towards submissions, both from top and bottom. Nothing reinforces that more than knowing all 14 of her wins are by stoppage. She will just plot forward with a tight guard. So she's like this, just coming forward. She'll throw a flurry of punches, rush in, and then body clinch or cage work you to the ground from there. It is constant, constant working for position and then submissions. She can chase though, which can get her into some scrambles that she probably doesn't want to be in where she ends up on her back or on her feet. For example, I have seen her ditch a pretty controlled half guard position for an ankle lock. She didn't get the ankle lock and then she was on bottom and these UFC judges are not going to like her on bottom. I mentioned that Pollyanna is a prospect. She's improving at a steady pace and I do believe that. In this matchup, I think she's probably faster. I think she has cleaner striking. She's probably got better footwork. But I also think Karine, and I'm only saying it like that because if you watch her fights, that's how all the announcers say her name. Um, she's more powerful. She's more willing to grapple. And she can beat Pollyanna the exact same way that Jillian Robertson did. Plenty of takedowns, plenty of control time. So Karine is the pick. And I already threw a money line bet on her at minus 115. I think she literally comes forward, grabs Pollyanna, drags her to the ground, and it's just a whole bunch of that. So big fan of Karina in this matchup, and I did a minus 115 money line bet. And then we've got Mike Trezano taking on Lucas Almeida. Mike Trezano, he's an ultimate fighter winner. He's a fun forward pressure striker with some real power and lots of energy. He, he keeps his power late in the fights and is constantly pressuring forward. He's a calculated striker who does a good job of mixing in that power with his speed. He can put his foot on and off the gas pedal and has an impressive fight IQ. If you go back to that Ludovic Klein fight where he was a massive underdog and pulled out that win, he sat on the stool between rounds, knew he was down and said, I need to turn it up to win this round. And that's literally what he did. He went out there, turned it up, took that round and took the fight. He's coming off a loss to Hakeem Dawadu where he lost a technical striking match, but we did see him work in some grappling. 
Lucas Almeida is a powerful striker who loves throwing a heavy one-two. He just loves coming forward, setting up a big right hand. And when he senses blood, he will literally drop his hands, march forward, and just throw whatever he needs to to try to get that finish. But he is aware enough to know that he's a striker and not a grappler. He managed ground control really well on top. But if his opponents start to get their wits about them and start to position on bottom, he just stands up, resets, and goes from there. His takedown defense is just okay. But what he does that I love is he'll make you pay for those entries. Meaning if you take a shot and he defends it, he's going to hit you and hit you hard on the exit to make you question if you want to take another shot. And this should be a really fun striker versus striker matchup with two guys who don't back down. I like Mike Trezano here because these are the fights that he wins, right? He will beat these brawling style strikers. It's the technical strikers that he has trouble with like Dawa do. Lucas Almeida is more of that brawling style striker who's head hunting and he's not really a technical guy who's working the body and then coming up. So I like Trezano here. But I don't love the minus 250 odds. But Mike Trezano is the pick. Then we have the co-main event of the evening. We have Dan 50K Ige taking on Mavzar Evloev. And Dan Ige is the real deal. He's got fantastic kickboxing with speed and power. As well as takedowns and jujitsu. He's exactly what modern mixed martial artists should be. He's good everywhere. He was on an incredible six-fight win streak before a few bumps in the road. But if you look at who he beat and who he lost to recently, it's all pretty solid. He beat Mursad Bektik, who's very, very good. He beat Edson Barbosa, who's very, very good. He knocked out Gavin Tucker with one punch. He's lost to Calvin Qatar. He lost to Korean Zombie. These are good losses for the most part and very good wins. Mavzar Evlaev is a killer. He's a fantastic wrestler who uses his striking really well to set up his takedowns. He'll keep his punches long, meaning he'll throw his right hand and he keeps it extended. The right hand will stay out there. And then as that's out there, he'll lower his level, take the shots on the legs and shucks the head with his hand. It's really nice the way that he does that. And that's very different than what most people do. Most people will either shoot the takedown while throwing the right hand or throw the right hand, bring it back, and then shoot the takedown. So leaving it there and then transitioning to the takedown works really, really well for him. And those little setups and his incredible chain wrestling is why he averages four takedowns per fight and he had nine against Hakeem Dawadu. And a lot of you love Dan Ige here. I've already seen the comments on different videos talking about Dan Ige is your early lock of the week. And I'm pretty sure all of you said the exact same thing in his last fight when he fought Josh Emmett. What did surprise me, though, in Dan's fight against Josh Emmett is he actually just took Josh down. And if that's the game plan here, it's not impossible that Dan can have some success because as great of an offensive wrestler Mazvar is, he does get taken down. Nick Lentz took him down in a split decision. Mike Grundy took him down six times. But with that being said, I'm very, very confident Mavzar wins and earns himself his sixth UFC decision win. And I took that at minus 155. So Mavzar Evlaev is the pick. And I bet Mavzar Evlaev to win by decision. I got it at minus 155. I'm pretty confident with that pick. You want to place a bet like that? We want picks.com slash bets. We have five partners. I did that one with Bet Online as well. If you jump in, you make a deposit, I'll send you 50 bucks as a thank you. And that takes us to the main event of the evening. We got two big time heavyweights, Alexander Volkov taking on Jarzinho Rosenstruck to find out who should really be working their way back to a title fight. Alexander Volkov is a top 10 heavyweight and he has been for the better part of five years. He's a very good striker and a high IQ fighter who is fast and has volume. He picks his shots well and he will adapt in a fight. He's not a big power guy, but his volume and timing suit him well enough to get finishes. Despite his last minute loss to Derek Lewis, he does have a very good chin and he's a pretty durable guy. Jarzinho Rosenstruck is a very heavy handed striker. He's coming off a one sided loss to Curtis Blades, but before that, he had a nice win over Augusto Sakai. What was interesting about that fight was 
we saw him pushing the pace and moving forward because historically Rosenstruck was a counter striker. He waits and many times falls behind and then either loses a decision or just manages to find that big punch. The biggest issue with Rosenstruck's style or that style is if he can't get the win in those striking exchanges, he does not have a backup plan. He has zero takedowns in the UFC. And while his takedown defense is solid at 75%, he has been taken down by all the better guys in the division. And this is a very interesting fight because a lot of you are giving up on Volkov, saying he looked terrible in his last few fights and he's on the downswing of his career. But I really don't see it that way. Yes, he lost to Tom Aspinall and quickly, but frankly, Tom Aspinall is a killer and he outgrappled Volkov. Before that, Volkov lost to Curtis Blades, who again outgrappled him. He was outstruck by Cyril Gan, but you know, Cyril Gan's movement is one of a kind and, and it was just too much for him. I think if Volkov plays a long technical striking game with Rosenstruck, he will win this fight. And frankly, even if Volkov wanted to work in some takedowns like he did against Stefan Struve and Fabricio Verdum, he could have some success there as well. The one and only thing that worries me in this matchup is that Derek Lewis loss, right? Volkov was dominating and then literally seconds away from winning a decision and his lights were put out. That is the one thing that worries me because Rosenstruck possesses that same one punch put you out power and he could be, he could win the same way. He could be on the wrong side of an almost decision and then bang, that one punch gets it done. But I'm going to side with Volkov here. I trust his fight IQ. I trust his move around long striking style to keep him out of danger. So Volkov is the pick. Guys, like, subscribe, do all the things. Join our free Discord. Nothing we do costs money. We have a free Discord. Hop into there. Give us your picks, your predictions there. And make sure you go to wewantpicks.com slash bets. Sign up with any one of our five betting partners. Make a deposit and we send you 50 bucks as a thank you.